I'm not sure about how I feel about those extra titles, because uh, if you watch the show, she died at the end, so... <laughs> Spoilers alert. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about serverless. Um, uh, maybe start with uh, some of my personal experience with uh, serverless. So a couple of years ago, I was working for a social network in London called Yubble, which was a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, it was supposed to be the new kid on the block, and uh, at the time, we had about, I think, a million people on the platform. Uh, not very big social network, quite small, still starting up. But we did manage to attract a few influencers from other platforms like uh, Instagram. And some of, our, some of our top users, Emily, for example, was one of our top users. At the time, when the whole platform had about a million people, she had, I think, a peak about 60,000 followers. And the interesting thing about building a social network, especially when you're starting out, is that, well, you've got all these influencers with a mass number of users, uh, followers, but most of the time, most of the users only have maybe one or two followers. And whenever this influencer would do something on a platform, they would post a new thing. Uh, Emily would often run those campaigns where she says, uh, hey guys, come and uh, vote on my post, and then at 10 o'clock tonight, I'm gonna announce a lucky winner for this beautiful designer handbag. So as a backend engineer, I look at my dashboard the whole day. Uh, you can probably imagine what's happening next, right? So for the whole day, nothing's happening. And at exactly 10 o'clock, as she predicted, you get a massive spike in traffic, sometimes 100x what you just, uh, from what happened just the previous uh, uh, minute. Um, so it makes my job really interesting. And unfortunately, at the time, all of our system, backend system, was running on EC2, and our system just couldn't scale fast enough. You have all this traffic coming in all at once, and the server just couldn't handle the load. So you had all kinds of performance issues, people getting really slow response time, looking at buffer screen, nothing's really happening. So it's not really great user experience. And also, at the time, to update our backend code, it takes 30 minutes of downtime. The whole system is going to go down and then back up, and with 30 minutes of nothing happening. If you use the app at a time, all you see is just nothingness. It's just a buffer screen, no, not even like a maintenance screen to say, please come back later. So none of it is, is good enough for today's standards. And even worse than that is that features used to take months to talk about and then design, to implement, to deploy. So our delivery to production was a couple of months for simple features. And one of my favorite speakers, Dan North, once said that the lead time to someone say th saying thank you is the only reputational metric that matters to us as engineers. Doesn't matter what you think you've done until your thing is running production and users enjoying it and someone saying thank you for the work you've done, it doesn't matter. So I, went, so I joined the company, realized we had a lot of technical problems that we're gonna deal with, and uh, we also need to rethink how we architect and run our application on the backend side of things. And within a very short number of months, uh, with a very a couple of engineers, uh, we managed to transform the entire system. We moved everything, pretty much entire architecture to run on serverless. And while, while you look at this, you may think, well, that side just looks a lot more complicated than this. But if you think about it, all the features and complexity already existed in here. It just, they were never explicit out there in your architecture. All of it is just hidden inside your code to see all those complexities. You can open up the code base, wait five minutes for the Visual Studio to load because it's got such a big code base, and then see all the complexities nested inside your code. And along the way, even though cost was never our main concern, wasn't the reason why we did any of this work, we implemented lots of new features, we managed to go a lot faster, and we also managed to save ourselves some really good cost saving as well on our AWS bill, compared to how much we were paying for EC2 for resources that we are not using, because again, remember, traffic is very spiky and very unpredictable, so we have to run bigger servers, much bigger cluster than we would like, and uh, most of the time, that server just sitting there doing nothing. So when we move to serverless, where we only pay when our code executes, we manage to save a lot of us uh, AWS bill. But most importantly for me is that in terms of velocity, we got to the point where instead of taking months to deliver something, most features will be delivered within a few days. And in uh, some cases, we will talk about our idea on how to improve search, and then we will design, implement it, test it, and ship it all within the same day. So essentially, your feature delivery went from months to sometimes hours. So my name is Yen Chui, I'm a long time AWS user and since last year, no, uh, 2018, I'm also one of the community heroes 
uh, that focus around the serverless space. So my journey with AWS and cloud started 10 years ago when I was working for a games company. Um, it, was, uh, it was then when everyone was building games on Facebook and some of the top games on Facebook at the time. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that. <laughs> Uh, FarmView had, uh, I think, something like 250 million daily active users. Uh, the games that I was working on was never that successful, unfortunately, but we still had games that had over a million, uh, a million daily active users easily. And then a couple of years later, everybody left Facebook and went on to mobile, so everyone started building mobile games, and of course, we follow suit as well. But at all this time, while all these different, sort of, I guess, technology becomes, uh, be uh, comes to the fore and uh, we have systems for that, you know, that need to be running 24-7 because our user base are now global. We're not building systems that cater for you know, people only that live in the Netherlands. We're building for systems that are going to be used by everybody all around the world. And then we also have to cater for the fact that it's very easy nowadays to have a runaway success that you have an app, and then you, all of a sudden it catches a tr uh, attention and gets some traction, and straight away, within a few weeks, maybe a few months, you end up with a large number of users. And that's why the cloud is so appealing in terms of being able to build for scale and have a really good resilience. You can deploy your code to run all around the world so that if one data center goes down, your application is still running with no problem. You can build systems that are far more secure compared to what you'll be able to do on-premises. And also importantly, speed. Not just in terms of speed of deployment and development, but also more importantly, the, the ability to iterate ideas against the market very, very quickly. And this is probably one of the biggest strengths when it comes to why do you want to use the serverless. So the cloud gives you a lot of these things out of the box, but it gives you in, the, in terms of very small, tiny sort of building blocks that you have to construct and build your own applications on top of. So to build something that's truly magnificent is still a, a lot of work in terms of composing all these different small building blocks together. And before the advent of serverless technologies as a back-end engineer who's been doing this for years, when I look at what is required to run something at scale in production, I have to think about a lot of things, starting from just the pure networking side of things, setting up VPCs, subnets, uh, net gateways. So basically a really long list of uh, three-letter acronyms uh, just to get the networking side of things ready. And you may want to skip some of these steps and at your own risk, because uh, if you don't do it right, then you run the risk of opening yourself to attackers, potentially accessing your database because you've left it publicly accessible, which of course is not going to be great when you, when you become the headline news that you, you leak the millions of users' details because of, uh, you haven't done your job properly. So you set up a networking, and then now you've got to think about how am I going to set up my virtual machines uh, from installing those uh, security patches, uh, updating any of my dependencies for NPM, for Node, and so on, and then have a set up how my system is going to auto-scale based on traffic, and make sure that I don't scale and run everything in one data center so that when the data center goes down, my entire application is gone. And then sub load balancing, and IAM roles, and log collection, all these things just so that I can start thinking about what am I going to do for my actual application to start looking at, okay, we need a web server, so let's write a web server using Express or um, Restify or whatever framework and configure authentication, all of that stuff through middleware. And after all this, then I can start writing that first line of business code. And when you consider how much hoops I've got to jump through just to ship and run one line of JavaScript, it's ridiculous. And most of it is just yuck shaving. So, so for those of you who are not familiar with the term yuck shaving, it's basically the things you got to do in order to get to doing the things that you actually need to do. It's all terribly, terribly distracting. And I've always wondered that why can't I just write the business logic I want and ship it like that and let somebody else take care of all that boilerplate code for me? Nonetheless, I don't want to do all these things myself either. It's been my job for many, many years, but they are also super important that someone does it and someone does it right because you need them to set yourself up for success in terms of scalability, in terms of security, in terms of uh, reliability. Because just because you can write some express app and spin up a web server, it doesn't mean that you have production-worthy system running for today's application that can really quickly scale to have millions and millions of users. And every time I hear the argument that, oh, well, we're just never going to need it. We've got like a handful of users, so we're never going to hit that level of scale where we need to have more than one server. And every time I hear that in the back of my head, I'm just thinking, 
why do you hate yourself? I mean, why are you, why are you betting against yourself to succeed in this world? Imagine, you know, you work very hard with you and your team. You're building on your new product, this great idea that you hope is going to change the world. And finally, someone pays attention. You finally, you got some traction, and people start using your app. It's great. It's time to celebrate. But along with your dreams and hopes for the whole team, everything crashes down with, along with your puny little server that you got running because that single server just can't handle the load. So a lesson that I've learned throughout my career, uh, which has been many, many years, <laughs> you do want to set yourself up for success. Of course, all these things that I talked about before are necessary evil. Uh, for many years, I considered them just part and parcel of the, just the cost of doing business. And of course, uh, for those of you who have been following sort of development in the backend uh, sort of space, you may hear of uh, Docker containers, and you may think, well, isn't that the solution? Is that the answer? Because one thing I keep hearing about is the how, well, when you're using Docker, when it works on your machine, it's going to be ready for production. That is the, that's the biggest lie the devil has ever told, even more so than the devil doesn't exist. Because in theory, it all sounds great that you finish your code, you test it, you run it, and then you ship it into production. Uh, but at this moment in time, you have no logging, you have no monitoring, you have no auto scaling. Well, when the system goes uh, more than what one server can handle or one, one container can handle, it's going to go down in the power of fire. Um, and then to actually do it well, do it properly, the whole art, the whole thing around the scheduling and running con and auto scaling containers has got a lot of complexities uh, involved. All the things we talked about earlier, all the multi-AZ, all that stuff is still necessary. It's still required when you're running containers. And to do it well, most people go to something like Kubernetes, Mesos, and all these other tools that allows you to schedule containers and scale them based on demand. And to then provision them into your actual a cloud environment, you have to use tools such as Terraform for infrastructure as code. And you want to use the tools like Vault to keep your and, sec and to securely store and encrypt your secrets and, and your credentials and so on. And for other things you're going to do around your application, like circuit breaking and all of that, you want to use a service match for those, some things like uh, Istio or Linkerd. So in practice, the fact that you've got something running on your machine using Docker still means that you're far, far away from having something that's actually worthy of production. And it's fun. You can have all these tools, and it's great that you have all these tools available to you today, but... There's still a lot of technology that I have to learn, I have to manage, I have to run in order to set up my environment. And again, all of it just feels like yuck shaving. It's stuff that I just got to do is a necessary evil, and I understand that. But I'd much rather if I something that someone can look after all of that for me and do a better job of it than making myself, available, uh, making myself responsible for all of them. And increasingly, we are dealing with systems that are dealing with large number of users that are global, that have to run 24-7, which in turn means that to tackle those challenges, our systems become more complex, and for, for a good reason. However, evolution just have not quite caught up with the, how quickly technology advances, and our brains haven't got any fast, any bigger, any, fa any better, so we have to do and handle more complexity with the same limited amount of cognitive resource that we, were, that we have. And the only way for us to really scale ourselves is to build better leverages that allow us to do more with less. And I find many customers uh, going through that cloud journey where they're taking existing applications, running on-premises, on data centers to the cloud. But when your application is running on virtual machines and on, on Docker and containers, by and large, you are still managing infrastructure. Sure, you have better tools for doing that these days, and the, inf the infrastructure itself are more capable compared to what it was many, many years ago, but this infrastructure itself is still very much your responsibility. And this particular quote from uh, Matt Klein, who is an engineer at Lyft and the creator of the Envoy proxy, I think really captures the essence of the problem here that unless your business is centered around infrastructure, infrastructure is basically overhead. And the time that, and energy you spend on managing and dealing with infrastructure is time and energy that you could have spent on differentiating your product instead. So really, what you should be doing instead is leverage your cloud provider to get as much and manage as much of the infrastructure as you possibly can so that you can focus on the things that actually matter to your customers, the things that your customers actually want. It's great that you've got all this beautiful infrastructure set up, but your customer probably just wants a simple login screen to, guess, to be able to log in and actually use the app. 
And when I think serverless, so typically we talk about any technology where you don't pay for them, where they're not running, and that most importantly, you don't have to worry about configuring, managing servers, uh, to, to how to set up scaling and all of that. And since Amazon launched the Lambda service back in 2014, serverless became a thing. And uh, I've been able to play this fun game where every time I say the word serverless to the public, someone reminds me there's still server running somewhere. Which, of course, just missing the point entirely. And I think, and I think Goyko says it best when he says that serverless is serverless in the same way that Wi-Fi is wireless. Even when you're dealing with Wi-Fi, there's still cables running around. It's just that when you're connecting to Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi connection, you don't think about those cables anymore. They're not your problems anymore to deal with. And serverless is very much the same way. Sure, your code still runs on a server somewhere, but that is no longer your responsibility. Uh, you might have also heard this uh, related term called uh, functions of service, and this is where you're going to find the poster boy for serverless technologies like uh, AWS Lambda function, where essentially to build a new application, a new a, uh, a API, what we do is write a very simple piece of function that takes in some invocation event, some contacts, and a callback function, and upload it to the cloud, and let the cloud provider handle when to call my function. It could be when a customer hits our REST API or hits our GraphQL a API, or when someone publishes a message from the IoT device and then I'll run some code. And all I have to do is write the business logic inside that function. Everything else I delegate to the, the cloud provider. And why is this so much better? Well, you get a lot of scalability out of the box and very, very fast, fast. Several minutes for that to happen. And when you scale up very, very quickly, you can, everybody can go from zero to a thousand concurrent executions uh, straight away. And uh, if you need to have a higher peak throughput, doesn't matter. That 1,000 is just a soft limit. You can just raise the request. And anyone who, um, or who's got a, 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 an account can also just get approved to raise to 3,000 automatically without too much um, hustle from the AWS uh, team. And the ones you have got those, uh, I guess, resources that are running your code, they also reuse as much as possible. So 1,000 concurrent executions, based on how long each, uh, each, um, each execution runs for, can give you a much higher number of requests per second. And to see some real-world examples of people doing this at massive scale, you can see the iRobot, who has been running a 100% serverless stack uh, for many, many years now, and they're running this at really big scale as well because they sell millions and millions of robots every year, mostly just through the Black Friday and Christmas Day, and pretty much all of those robots come online at the same time within a very short time window, so they also experience very spiky traffic as well. However, for them, when all these different, uh, different robots come online, it's just business as usual. You know, they don't really need to do very much, because again, they leverage the platform to get all that scalability and resilience. And you also have companies like Basel, who serves uh, over 80 million uh, monthly users on their new site. And if you look at uh, what other companies have done, you also have Lego, who has gone completely serverless on the e-commerce side of things that for the processing all these orders. And then you have Thomson Reuters, uh, Finra, The Zone. Many companies are using serverless technologies at scale. And for most of that workload, because you don't pay for your code until you actually run, you also find that your code becomes more scalable, but also cheaper at the same time. And since Lambda deploys every single function to three data centers just by default, and you don't pay for that redundancy, it means that you get a really good baseline resilience for your application without having to spend a lot of extra work to, infrastructure, to uh, architect it yourself and to pay for that actual redundancy when you're not using them. And since you don't have to look after the security of your open system anymore and to remember to patch your OS every couple of weeks uh, whenever there's some outbreak comes, uh, 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 comes out, it also means your application is more secure. But again, I keep going back to this, is that it just makes it a lot faster for you to get something out there, to have an idea and be able to test it in the market, to start iterate on those ideas so that you can get rid of the bad ideas and find the good ones and make them better and make them great. And you do that by taking a look at all the things that I used to have to do just to get something running in production to start testing the idea against the market. Most of that has become either irrelevant or, or trivial to do when it comes to using serverless technologies like Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, and so on. And this is getting more and more important today because it's just really hard to find engineers who understand all of this stuff, understand all the complexities that come to AWS. 
And for truly full stack uh, developer, they are really, really rare and uh, really expensive to hire as well. I've done so much interviews uh, in, in the past couple of years, uh, several hundred interviews, uh, many of which are for full stack positions. And when I plot uh, the candidate skill set against what we care about on the back end versus what we care about on the front end, you typically get someone who's either very good on front end technologies but have very, I guess, limited exposure to a lot of things that we care about as the back end engineers. Or you have back-end engineers who are you know, really good with building stuff for scale, resilience, and all of that, knows AWS really well, but have limited exposure to a lot of great, the best and greatest technology that's happening in the front-end space. And it's nobody's fault, because there are just so much things you've got to learn on both the front-end side of things, but also on the back-end side of things. And we only have 24 hours per day, every one of, every one of us. So there's only so much that you can dedicate to learning and become a master of your craft. So trying to find someone who is strong on both sides of the fence is really, really hard. And when you consider that how much you've got to know to be able to build a production-ready application running in the cloud without, if you run stuff on virtual machines or on containers, like I said earlier, there are just so much things you've got to learn and be able to do well in order to have something that's actually production-worthy compared to serverless, whereby a lot of front-end focused teams can just delay the point at which they need to have a back-end specialist because in terms of what they need to know, there's actually a fair amount that you've got to know still, but it's much easier. The, end, the bar of entry is much lower compared to the alternative. And if you're a back-end engineer, uh, engineer specialist like myself, uh, your job also becomes much, much easier to do and also allows me to do so much more with so much less effort and the stress and all of that because unlike you guys, when something goes wrong in production, I'm the one that people call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so with serverless technologies, you get so much out of the box and you got a very much, much lower bar of entry in terms of whether or not the teams need someone who's a really specialist on the backend side of things to be able to have something running in production. And with uh, the advent of the technologies like GraphQL and AppSync, which I think Nada is going to tell you about later on, it's really easy for you to build a GraphQL endpoint, uh, deploy it, and have AWS run it at scale and highly resilient fashion using AppSync that connects to databases directly, connects to search, connects to your functions for custom business logic, so that you can better focus your time and energy on improving the user experience. For most users, the UI, what they see in the app, is the system, and that's where you're going to deliver the most value and impact in terms of improving the overall user experience. And as far as I think I'm concerned, as far as everybody should be concerned, the back end should just work. It shouldn't be that difficult. It shouldn't require you to learn the whole degree just to be able to put something out there that's really for success. And, I, and luckily, I think it doesn't have to nowadays, especially with the technology that we have in the service space. And with that, I'm right on time, and uh, thank you guys very much uh, for your time. And if you do need to go on and get in touch with me, you can find me on theburningmonth.com. I also offer a lot of consulting services, and I'm also running a workshop in the March in the Amsterdam, uh, not far from here, actually, uh, where I cover a lot of the, guess, the sort of tips and best practices in terms of how to use service technologies uh, well. And you can also get a 20% off uh, with the, this uh, discount code, uh, front end love as well. With that, Thank you so guys uh, so very, uh, very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.